also, just before we do indeed get started, um, I'm just going to point out, probably all of you spotted the fact that I added a point for number 89 on the exam because everybody answered it correctly but the answer key was given incorrectly. I need to be more diligent in checking how the publisher bills the exam because it's not always correct. So anywho, uh, that helped some people move up from a uh, move up by a grade because they were right at something nine, you know, and now they are into another higher grade. For tips for people who are just not getting the grade they want, um, you really need to be more diligent with not procrastinating until the last minute and trying to cram. Uh, you need to bite off sizable chunks of that elephant on a daily basis rather than to try to swallow the whole thing the day before the exam. That never works. Uh, you need to be more diligent with taking notes. You need to be more diligent with uh, reading through the uh, textbook. You need to be even diligent in seeking help through tutoring if uh, uh, you know if you take advantage of that that will never be a waste of your time. Um, can't think of a whole lot else because uh, and I one of you whose name I won't call uh, who emailed me about that very topic, you are aware of who you are, please look at the email I sent you yesterday um, to give you some guidelines on how to get your grade much better than it is. Okie dokie. So, with that in mind, we now move to the first half of chapter 15. So, the first half of chapter 15, which is on the topic. Yes, Marty. I would just like to um, bring it to your attention that I don't know what question it was, but the, one of the questions pertaining to the early onset of um, puberty for young girls, you, your, your, your question was, does um, a, a loving, close relationship with a father bring on early puberty? And you're, you said yes, but the book said that the opposite is true. Um, a early onset loving, close relationship with a father delays puberty and the conflict and troubled young girl, that makes early puberty comes on upon her. Uh, the very last part of what you said, repeat it, because I was in the middle of trying to jot down something, oh. jot down well, some words. Says, the, the book says, a conflicted, troubled young girl has early puberty, develops pu early puberty. It's, it, let me help you there. It's pu, not pru. It's puberty. But go puberty. ahead. Okay. Puberty. That brings on early puberty. All right. But you had, you had said that a close, loving relationship with a father brings on uh -huh. early puberty. Uh huh. And the book I says the opposite. The book says the opposite. I do recall saying, that. Book I do recall saying that, so right. I'm gonna I'm gonna check it, and uh, if if I need to add a point, uh, I will. Um, you know. So thanks for bringing that to my attention. I'll have to scan through the exam to figure out which one it is all hundred questions but that's not a biggie no no okay. worries so if indeed I do make a change there I will make everybody like I just said receive a point for those who answered it the way it ought to have been answered if you know never mind I don't need to say more until I check it out Okay, as I was starting to say, uh, first half of chapter 15 happens now, so if there, since there are 43, 43 pages, we're going to get to at least 20, hopefully, today. So the topic 
is the physical and cognitive development uh, when you reach middle adulthood. And uh, indeed, if you recall when we looked at uh, adolescence and we, we learned that the, the topic or the construct of adolescence is a social construct, the same is true for middle age. In other words, it's not an automatic thing that happens when you reach a certain age, just as adolescence used to not exist because you went from being a child to being an adult a couple hundred years ago or even more recent than a couple hundred. Okay, so middle age is also a social construct. Um, so, there is no, consens no consensus, that is no agreement across everybody and everywhere about when it starts uh, and when it ends. But uh, because the textbook has to give some kind of range, it gives a 40 to 65, which is at least a reasonable range. Um, but uh, there's no specific biological or social event that says because this just happened to my body, this just happened in my life, I am now in middle age. Uh, so in the U.S., middle age is really, of course, a state of mind because some people at 35 feel middle age, let alone they haven't reached 40 yet, okay, you know? Uh, other people, as it says at the bottom, in their 60s and 70s, consider themselves to be middle-aged. But then there could be a 60-something who really thinks of themselves as at the last stage, the, the late life stage, because their life is just so miserable, unhappy, maybe they're unhealthy, maybe whatever reasons they feel old but then you've got a 75 year old who feels young so it's all together about I, I, sh I shouldn't say all together largely about a mentality that one has that's either the glass is half full for them or it's half empty the aging experience tells us that most younger middle-aged people see their lives as still needing improvement so uh, even if you are as young as 35 but you somehow see yourself as middle-aged you've got some gray hair already and uh, maybe you've had a few health issues some of which might be chronic and those sorts of things you are going to easily think of ways that if my life were so and so I had better health I had more money I didn't have as many problems in, in, in employment uh, you know various things can cause a person to say wow the other side is greener on that other side of the fence I wish I were over there and um, uh, most older middle-aged adults are satisfied with most areas of their life. Now, those areas they show us are social, financial, and health. And again, that's person to person. Because if your social, financial, and health aspects of you are glass half full, not glass half empty, what is not to love and as an older middle-aged person you are therefore feeling good to go but if socially financially and health wise or any one of those three let alone all three uh, is on the negative side you have few friends your finances are in rough shape your health is suffering then um, uh, that statement about most older middle-aged adults being satisfied with most areas of their life is not true of that person 
so uh, largely hopefully more than not most older middle-aged people are satisfied with most areas of their life um, for most people it tells us that at least up until about age uh, 75 uh, aging is positive again we can do a yeah but with that one also it's positive for those who uh, for whom that second bullet point is true they have uh, a social financial and health uh, uh, positive life in those three areas um, so you know people like Betty White who's 95 for heaven's sake is still uh, positive and happy sure you might say well yeah she's got buckets of money because she's a movie I mean she's a, a, a celebrity she's a star well being a star having buckets of money does not automatically make for happiness if that were true people wouldn't be jumping off ledges and shooting themselves to death and what have you committing whatever form of suicide wealthy is you know they're filthy rich so that tells you that that though financial health is something we aspire to and we are at greater peace when we have it it doesn't mean that if we've got you know enough money that we don't have to worry about that aspect of our lives it doesn't mean that that is going to mean we're happy if we're not healthy if we don't have a a, a healthy social life as well as a healthy body we can have money and still be miserable so uh, even though it says up until about age 75 aging is a positive experience um, it can be a positive experience beyond 75 or it can be a negative experience at 45 for heaven's sake you know it, everything is relative when it comes to aging so some physical changes are to be expected uh, so behavioral and lifestyle factors uh, dating from youth can affect our physical changes and how true is that it's just too bad that when you're in your teens and young 20s even all through your 20s or even older than that even it's too bad that many don't put their twos and twos together in enough time to save their uh, uh, health and and so you know it all together is dependent upon let me take out the word all together it is dependent upon a couple of factors your genes are certainly factored in where you can live like really stupid do really dumb stuff and have certain genetic cards in your favor as it were also you can um, those who do choose at a young age not to do stupid stuff you know turn into drug addicts alcoholics smoke like you know a train I mean you know doing appropriate stuff saves everything from your outward appearance to your inward condition so people look at a certain person who might be much older than they think that person is they assume the person's 50 but the person could be 60 or even older because their skin is younger they haven't smoked like a truck and gotten you know that pallor that smokers develop the wrinkles that smokers develop um, and um, you know other things with the brain that get messed up when uh, you have engaged in drug use and messed up the neurons of your brain and they're all confused up there until 
if you get off drugs you get rehabilitated even then there's an aspect of your brain chemistry that never goes back to its perfect state that it was before you became a user and a, an abuser um, okay so these these uh, this statement is very true about dating from back uh, to when you were young can affect you when you are in your middle age uh, people who are active early in life reap the benefits later in life so you can be in your teens you can be in your young adult years you can have just been way too overweight you never exercise uh, you eat all the wrong stuff well how's that working for you when you're 50 60 70 etc uh, so use it or lose it as they say here is true not just of the body but of the brain you you've got to uh, use it uh, in order to become more and more and more intelligent so age related visual issues are these on the list here so you know um, I don't need to necessarily read them I'm just going to point out the last two sub bullet points about presbyopia and myopia uh, just to to say that presbyopia is when you see stuff far away uh, but not up close and myopia is just the opposite you can see stuff up close but not far away okay a lot of times before I move on a lot of times you will see older people with those really black sunglasses on with the wide sides to keep out light because of that third bullet point sensitivity to light is uh, the reason for them needing to wear those kinds of glasses so moving from vision to hearing so presbycusis uh, is the loss of hearing Presby, by the way, might remind some of you of Presbyterian, uh, the, you know, denomination. Um, so Presby means elder. So Presbyterian churches are run by the elders of uh, the church. That is, there's an elder board who dictates the uh, way the church should be should function and so elder uh, hearing older persons hearing loss presbycusis so a gradual hearing loss is just that you don't even the older person the middle-aged person and forward beyond middle-aged into late they don't well middle-aged they don't realize that their hearing is getting worse and uh, it, it's only when maybe one of their children uh, say, why is the TV so loud? And, and you don't realize that it was loud. And um, it speeds up when you get to be in your 50s. Your hearing loss uh, is, it becomes worse. But quite honest, not quite honestly, I mean, this is a true statement. However, one reason for presbycusis is not always because you're literally losing your hearing a reason for the the, the sensation or the the children coming to a conclusion that mom dad is losing their hearing is really because mom and dad need to go and this is not a put down because some people have small ear canals so sometimes you need to go to the doctor and have your ear canals irrigated because it's simply a wax buildup. It's not uncleanly, and, and I too have small ear canals and just had an irrigation done. Okay, uh, and so, so has Joy. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, yeah, and and mine needs to be about. She said hers is yearly. Mine needs to be about every six months because it builds up rather quickly. So you might suggest that uh, to your parent or parents uh, because maybe their hearing is fine if the wax were removed. Again, not a put down. Small ear canals. Uh, you can't. You you just can't get at it. Um, so. Yeah, and it's only after I have that done that, yeah, things like, oh, wow, things are so, so, I can hear, and I didn't know I wasn't hearing, right? So, okay. Um, yes, um, sir. Um, over the last decade or so, it's been reported that a lot of people are losing hearing at early age, middle age or younger because of this, this tendency to put earbuds in our ear. And play uh -huh. loud music for you know yeah. continuous periods of time. Yeah. It's going to affect a lot of people. I stopped. That's very, well, very true. I, yeah, I stopped doing it for the most part, but you know, loud music, especially with earbuds, is really messing yep. a lot of people up. Yeah, don't get me started on a whole bunch of stuff with regard to just that as an example. But whether it's that as as an example or these loud concerts or uh, yeah, there are reasons why things are getting worse. And when I said don't get me started, I'm going to name thing number two, not just loud concerts to go along with your earbud example, but uh, we are developing physical problems because of the constant head down, whether it's in front of a desktop computer, like I'm always in front of one, so I go roughly every six weeks thereabouts to get a massage and I'm always extremely sore and tight up in my shoulder and neck area or the looking down constantly at cell phones is messing not only with your neck and shoulder area but with your uh, elbows uh, and, and so forth so our life amenities are or life choices in terms of the earbud thing um, is not necessarily conducive to good health. All right. Other physical changes uh, are also taking place in middle age. Uh, sensitivity to taste and smell and uh, to sensitivity to touch and pain. Um, strength and coordination um, is, is less you, you're less strong, but that is a, yeah, but, uh, the third one about strength and coordination is a yeah, but, because you can be weak as a young person if you never work out, or you can be strong as a middle-ager if you work out on a regular basis, uh, but, they do have a point that even if you are a healthy, regular, workout, middle-aged person, at a point, at some point along the way, whether, I don't know, you're in your 50s or whatever you are, 60s, whatever, you probably can't be a good match to, I don't know, John Cena or somebody. You know, you, you're, you're, you're going to be losing a little, but just, I don't know how many of you saw this by chance, I think it was about three weeks ago or less, on uh, NBC Nightly News, uh, where Lester Holt always tends to show something that's inspirational at the end of his, uh, I think it's especially on Monday nights. At any rate, he showed this 98-year-old woman who it still teaches yoga and the chick was twisting her legs up behind her feet behind her neck and I couldn't do that when I was 18 let alone when I get to be 98 and she also does ballroom dancing she always wears high heels they showed her walking down the hallway as she was leaving whether she was leaving the dance studio or the yoga they didn't indicate uh, but she was walking without a walker, without a cane, upright, 
you go, girl. So it's it's like wow, you know, strength and coordination doesn't necessarily have to diminish all that much, if at all. If I take her for an example, um, you know. So use it or lose it is right. Joy said. Um, so endurance. Now there's a decrease in basal metabolism um, so basal metabolism is a measure of how much energy is needed for your heart and respiration functions to to continue <laughs> so there is a uh, decrease in that energy as you age thus a decrease in how long you can do an endurance kind of exercise uh, walking jogging what have you something that requires toughness and stick to uh diminishes because of the decrease in your basal metabolism manual dexterity um, you, when you were younger, you could do certain things. I don't know what example I could give. Maybe, I don't know, a Rubik's Cube. Maybe that's not a good example. But you could do things with your fingers more easily without effort or thought. That is a little harder to do as you age. And it's harder as you age to engage yourself in tasks that involve a choice of response this or that think fast and and it, it's easier to do that your brain works better and your brain works better when you're younger because of myelination where the speed of processing is uh, you are your brain is capable of speed of processing because you uh, have that myelin around your axons which causes the messaging from axon to axon to move faster more efficiently but myelination begins to slowly but surely over time uh, break down however this is a yeah but though that's true it will break down at a slower rate if, once again, use it, you won't lose it. Uh, or you will lose it slower. So, uh, I know because of my late start in the academic world, I was middle-aged, as I have told you. I know that my brain is much sharper now than it was prior to that, that journey beginning at age 41. And I know that my IQ is higher because IQ is not what you're born with. It's a product, a bottom line, of what you know. And the more you know, the higher your IQ number because you can score better on that IQ test because you know more. So um, for that kind of person who's using it in order not to lose it, their tasks that involve a choice of responses, they're going to be better at that than the uh, middle-aged and older person who doesn't use it. So some of what I just talked about is probably in this list, uh, the brain at midlife. Okay, aging brains work more slowly and have more difficulty juggling. juggling. Yeah. We've talked about that. That's true when it's true, but it's not always true all the time for everybody under all circumstances. And I talked about the myelin breaking down. Okay. Uh, physical activity can help brains uh, stay healthy. So it's not just the learning, uh, academic and other uh, informal learning. You read a lot. You learn a lot through your love of reading good books, okay? Um, um, but you also 
uh, help that brain stay healthy by your physical activity because it all works together brain body uh, mind mind is not brain by the way mind is really the spirit of you that operates upon the brain so if you have an optimistic outlook on life your brain is glass half your I'm sorry your mind is glass half full not glass half empty that is going to help your actual physical brain be a sharper one of course we are aware hopefully nobody would disagree with this last bullet point about middle-aged adults being better drivers than younger people however that's not a put down because there are some very safe driving young people they're not in that stereotype of reckless and thoughtless and risk-taking uh, there are some who are you know acting like they have a brain in their head as opposed to others who well uh, let me see if I can run this light or have a drag race down the city street with this dude who took off before I took off and how dare he or she take off before I take off so I'm gonna show them a thing or two who cares about the speed limit being 35 I, you flying Jack so I mean hey you know um, okay structural and systemic changes so uh, indeed the skin is less tight is what taut means uh, it, it, it's a little looser not as smooth uh, because the layer of fat that gave us that smooth skin when we were youngsters um, is diminishing that's why you rarely see I don't know if I could say never but I can surely say rarely see an older person I, now I'm beyond middle-aged in my what I'm trying to tell you now I'm talking like the last stage of life which is later late life you rarely see a person who's overweight they tend to just get thinner uh, and uh, that's a lot of reasons to that and we'll look at that more when we get to that age and stage but the layer of fat begins in middle age to become a little thinner not necessarily that you are going to lose a lot of weight but what is starting to happen in your middle age you first gain then you lose then you lose then you gain as it has down there in a in that bullet point that you can see uh, so the yo-yo thing is something that is a wrestling match in middle age uh, your hair is starting to thin out I envy the, the the rare person whose genes dictate that they are going to have a head full of hair all of their lives and all of us probably know somebody who's got a head full of hair I just hate them but anyway <laughs> yeah, yeah so uh, people sweat less it, it interesting about that don't quite know why but anyhow the sweat glands diminish um, we talked about the next thing so move on uh, lower bone density um, so that's why grandma when she falls she'll break something whereas when you're young and fall you just bounce back up and keep on chilling so it's it's uh, you know uh, a requirement by your doctor when you get to be somewhere in your middle age that you have I think it's every two years a bone density scan so I've been having those for a number of years now um, but some of that is um, just like hair is genetic for those lucky stiffs who have a bunch of hair um, the bone density 
there is a, a an aspect of that that's genetic. Some people's bones are strong, like the 98-year-old chick who could put her foot behind her head. So, I mean, like, you know, you hate people like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> a vital capacity of the lungs diminish. Um, so, so, the vital capacity of the lungs diminishing goes right back to a couple pages ago about the basal metabolism lowering, it, which is the lowering of the energy to run your heart and lungs is another way to put it. So that's why the vital capacity of the lungs diminish. Okay, obviously a female topic. We're going to get to andropause in a, maybe on the next page or one coming up pretty soon where it deals with men. But dealing with females now uh, in middle age when a woman permanently stops ovulating and thus menstruating, uh, she's no longer able to get pregnant. And this happens on average when she's 50 to 52 years old. Uh, and leading up to menopause is peri. Peri means around. So around the menopause um, coming uh, is, is about a three to five year period of time. Um, slowing, uh, it, it, three to five year slowing process before menopause. So it's a slowing process in the fact that for some women, not all, they will sometimes have menstruation, other times it won't happen, other times it will from month to month to month, um, and so forth. Estrogen and overproduction uh, decline beginning in uh, the mid-30s. So, of course, this lets us see why, or we it doesn't automatically let us see, but when I explain this, you'll get it. Back in a couple hundred years ago, when there was no such thing as adolescence, and you went from being a child to being an adult, it was um, one of the reasons why families were much larger back then than they tend to be today because the woman might have started having, preg having uh, children when she was 13, 14, 15. Uh, uh, students of scripture believe that Mary was only about 14. Some think she might have been a little uh, younger even uh, when she uh, became impregnated by uh, Holy Spirit to have Jesus. At any rate, uh, the, the early starting of having children, which goes all the way through the 20s, even into the mid-30s, um, it is a reason why there were large families, but there, I won't tell you reason number two because I bet you somebody's going to be able to know or guess it at any rate. What would be another reason why uh, a couple hundred or even a hundred years ago people had much larger families? Any thoughts on why? Yes, Joy. Your, uh, mortality rate among your children was higher so in order to perpetuate your family name as well as to maintain the family farm or whatever that estate might have been mm -hmm. you had to increase your odds of mm -hmm. that continuing so I remember a physician saying you know, a hundred plus years ago cemeteries were for children they were not for the elderly ah sad but true and both points I had in mind one of your points but both points uh, hedging your bets uh, increasing your odds children died earlier my particular thinking was all hands on deck you, you needed those hands to take care of the farm because it was an agricultural uh, point in time where that's how you made your living um, so it's true. Uh, attitudes toward menopause. Well, in the U.S., most women view menopause positively 
I can uh, certainly relate to that. Okay. Uh, uh, oops, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> They're laughing at me over here. <laughs> yeah. Um, most express relief, yep. Many see it as a time of greater independence and personal growth. Indeed. I mean, it, it, it frankly is a nuisance, and so no more of that. Okay. Um, moving along. Symptoms of menopause include, uh, uh, again, experiencing little disc, well, not again, because we haven't really talked about this. Some women do experience a lot of discomfort. Some do. But many, little to not much at all, there's the nuisance hot flash, uh, but only 50% of women, roughly, experience hot flashes um, uh, along with hot flashes some people experience the list that you see there that I don't really need to read because you can read um, and uh, there's degrees to which these symptoms express themselves within individual uh, but there are treatments for for these maladies, if they fall, if if a particular woman falls prey to them, she can go to her doctor, and and the doctor can prescribe stuff. Okay, cultural differences on how females look at menopause. So we already talked about a lot of women don't experience many or if any symptoms at all. Uh, the Japanese women, um, honestly, I didn't take time to review, so I don't know if anybody has reviewed what the book tells us about Japanese women, whether the, it's a positive or negative uh, outlook, but since I didn't get the opportunity to review, I, I won't comment on that. I'll leave that to you to look it up. African American women have more positive feelings about it than do Caucasian women. Well, my guess, although I'm not sure what the book says about it, again, lack of review time, but uh, being African American, I can throw in a reasonable two cents value to what I'm about to say, is that African American culture, African American women, don't tend to think of aging as negatively at all as typically a Caucasian woman uh, might want to do. Uh, you see very few, I'm not saying none, but not a lot of American women, for example, in, involve themselves in plastic surgery. But that is something that's more likely to uh, be in the mind of a white woman who wants to maintain youth at all costs, so to speak. Um, but again, you know, that's a broad stroke brush because not all white women are run into the plastic surgery. Not all are scared of getting older. It, it, you know, but if we're talking percentages, then these this particular phrase is correct about the difference between African American versus Caucasian women. Uh, but more research is needed on that. All right. Changes in male sexuality. There is no evidence to really support there is such a thing as male menopause, uh, known as andropause. Um, but Though that's a correct statement, some things do happen to men, such as testosterone decreasing in its uh, number, uh, or not number, in its levels, uh, decreases slowly, about 1% per year after age 30. But there's no strong relationship between testosterone levels and sexual performance. So, okay, he doesn't have a zillion sperm running around down there like he used to, but 
he's still got enough and he's still got enough testosterone to still be attracted to his mate uh, and want to express love in the most intimate way with her he's able to do that um, unless he has erectile dysfunction now okay there are bunches of reasons for erectile dysfunction just as for that matter there are a bunch of reasons for women having what used to be called dyspareunia and vaginismus it was psychological and the same reason erectile dysfunction can be in the man's life is psychological he is unhappy with the relationship he's passive aggressive he's paying her back so to speak and he is literally unable to have the erection because he is upset with her and on the sly he is unable and I don't when I say on the sly I'm not saying he's pretending not to be able to have an erection because you can't really pretend either you're gonna have one or you're not gonna have one that's yeah the nature of the male anatomy so so but there's another reason uh, more reasons for erectile dysfunction could be medical he could love you with all of his heart but have to settle for either whether his medical condition allows him to to uh, his doctor to say it's okay for you to get a medication be it Levitra or the various erectile dysfunction medications that are out there it's okay because your illness your medical issue won't interfere that is the medication won't interfere with it or make it worse so whether it's medical or whether it's psychological uh, erectile dysfunction happens but just know there's a difference between you're not having sex with your husband because he's not having an erection don't automatically assume it's because he doesn't love you anymore you need to simply really the two of you if you're really willing to do it needs to go together to the doctor and have the doctor talk to you about the various reasons for it so that you can leave that doctor's visit as the wife saying it wasn't me you know you you, you 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 gain a little bit of your self value back when you learn it's not you it's situations going on with in him physically and uh, uh, medically all right sexual activity uh, sex satisfaction with sex life diminishes gradually during the 40s and 50s okay it, I'm gonna hold off on my yeah but just for a minute okay when it's true that it diminishes during your 40s and 50s it could be related to the medical thing the chronic illness okay uh, or uh, monotony in the relationship which I kind of more or less talked about in different words a minute ago or what I didn't talk about was huge burdens in your life so you love your wife you're not medically having reasons for inability to have an erection but heavy burdens rest upon your shoulders and that's you you just unable to really function because of those burdens of whatever nature the burdens may be uh, uh, children in trouble you've got young adult children or teenage kids or uh, you know that are in serious problems making serious wrong choices maybe it is financial as well or one or the other 
etc. So there are worries that can cause you not to be relaxed enough, non-anxious enough to settle down enough for your brain to send the message to your genitals as a male to be able to engage sexually with your spouse because you're just burdened. Um, okay. Health in middle adulthood. Most middle-aged Americans are healthy. Now, I would agree with that. Uh, but low socioeconomic status uh, it, it causes increasing health problems. So, you know, your social life is horrible, your economic life is horrible, and so you are more prone to illness because there's no optimism in your life. Without optimism, it all works together. Uh, mind, body, spirit, it, it all works together so that uh, your immune system is compromised when you're constantly anxious, constantly depressed, constantly worried. Um, and in turn, you know, just it's a cycle. Okay. Most middle-aged people experience a decline in energy levels. Once again, that's the third time of saying it a slightly different way. But it's all about that uh, basal metabolism. It's all about that vital capacity of the lungs uh, being uh, decreased and so forth. Health trends uh, for middle-aged folks. High blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes is a plaguing threesome, the trifecta of health issues within middle age. Behavior influences health. Longer lives and shorter periods of disability are associated with if you don't smoke and have never smoked, you have fewer wrinkles, thus you look younger, thus your insides are healthier, your lungs, your heart, thus the prognosis for a longer life, duh. I just wish people got that. Uh, avoiding becoming overweight or, okay, okay, you end up overweight, then lose it, okay? Um, regular, and I'm preaching the sermon to me on that one, but yeah, you know, we, we, we need to always work on it. Um, regular exercise, hey, so you got, you know, in middle age, a, a knee issue or a hip issue. Well, you can walk even though you might have to walk with a cane. I mean, really, you don't have a whole lot of excuse to be able to do something. Um, low stress levels. The less stress in your life was what I was just talking about a minute ago. Okay. Only one-third of U.S. adults follow good health recommendations. 33 percent. 67 don't. 33 percent do. Um, follow good health recommendations. I mean, at middle age and older, you know that you're supposed to eat fruits and vegetables. You're supposed to eat less red meat, more chicken and fish. You know you're supposed to have less amount of carbs, but I love it and I don't want that stupid spinach. Uh, give me that mac and cheese. So, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that's me because I happen to love spinach, but the point is, uh, the mentality is there, you know, and, and you hear people say, well, you're going to die of something, so, you know, I'm not going to stop smoking. I've been smoking for 40 years. I'm not going to stop smoke or stop my, I love my starches, my carbs, my sugars, you know. I hate vegetables and fruits but and don't even take my steak away from me I'll hurt you so it's like you know what are you gonna do okay 
socioeconomic status, and health. Uh, of course, your income is low. Your social status may be suffering. Well, duh. There you go. Same thing I've been saying. Immune system interacting with brain, interacting with your your psyche, your psychology, your sense of self. Okay, your 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 glass is going to be half empty, not half full. And when all of that is together, your health is is suffering. Uh, lower life ex well, of course, it's lower life expectancy. Poor health makes shorter life. Um, more activity limitations. Um, I could yeah, but that one a, a wee bit because you don't have to have money to go for a walk. Okay, so I mean. Uh, the limitation part that I do have to agree with, though, is if your health is poorer to the point that uh, you have so little energy that even going for a walk you get barely a little distance and you're whooped. So it's like, okay, I get that. But don't use SES in and of itself by itself to think, you shouldn't get out there on the walking trail. Doesn't cost a dime. Uh, lower well-being. Well, yeah. Uh, I gotta do a yeah, but on that one. Okay. You're you don't have much money. You might not have a boatload of friends, but your lower your sense of yourself doesn't have to be lower if if you have a high level of spiritual connection. If you have a high level of faith, which brings a high level of joy, which brings a high level of peace, which brings a high level of clarity, which brings a high level of common sense, and I could keep going, but I'll stop there, then no matter you don't have a bunch of money, or a whole bunch of friends, you still can have a high sense of well-being. Uh, more restricted access to health care. Uh, that would, I would have to agree, only to a degree. Uh, because it, even people on public assistance have Medicaid, uh, which is why I have said over the semester from time to time anyway that the poorest among us in the US is wealthy compared to third world countries where there is no such thing as insurance for anybody and they have to just look out for one another um, so yes there is a restricted access even for those on Medicaid because Medicaid is only going to cover the necessities as opposed to a more Cadillac kind of private insurance where it'll cover something more broadly. Uh, okay, that's true. So in that sense, it's restricted to that degree. So, race, ethnicity, and health where it tells us that overall death rates from cancer have declined, thank goodness, but not among African Americans, for example, where in the African American culture, uh, higher death rates still exist for lung, colorectal, prostate, and, or prostrate, and uh, breast cancer. Um, oh, they spelled that wrong. I said it right. Prostate. Prostrate means laying out flat on the floor. <laughs> <sighs> but prostate is what they should have said there. Okay, why? Is it because the genes that caused us to be born African American is the reason? No. The reason is, especially among African American males, they are the least likely, along 
followed closely, if not tied with, Hispanic males, but okay, okay. They are the least likely to go to a doctor. They just are. That, that whole pride thing, like, how's that working for you? It, 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 it's really smart to go have yourself checked out, but they're scared to go because the doctor will find something wrong and they're circumvented circ strange thinking, whatever fancy word I'm trying to think of. Anyway, their way of thinking is if I don't know then I'm cool. It doesn't matter if I don't know so I'm not going to go to a doctor. And uh, I know an African American gentleman right now whose wife, due to her trust in me, uh, told me that her husband has kidney cancer. She has breast cancer for fourth stage, and it is not in remission. But she. Uh, even though it's not in remission, she's a woman of strong faith. And she knows that she's going to be healed either in this life or the next. One way or the other, she's going to be healed. On the other hand, he could be perhaps a better prognosis, medically speaking, if he were to go and get it looked at and, and, and taken care of. He could be in his remission, but no. He's got that mentality, what I don't know won't hurt me. And uh, so that's not really good, but it's prevalent among, among the African American culture in males. Okay, what about females in the African American culture? Um, a level of that sort of applies to us too, us as in broad stroke speaking here. Um, we're not gonna hurry up and go either but when I mean we will go more quickly than our mate might go or our brother son father might go um, hypertension is 50 percent more prevalent high blood pressure um, is 50 percent more prevalent because of all kinds of psychological and cultural and social reasons that drive our pressure up, let alone a lot of times we eat the wrong way. Um, so anyhow, okay. Higher rates are attribute, attributable to differential treatment. What that is saying in so many fancy long words is that sometimes we get a diagnosis when we do go for medical help that assumes certain things are the reason we have this issue or complaint or the test showed this. The assumption is sometimes a misdiagnosis on the part of the medical community, thus through that misdiagnosis we get prescribed X to treat the wrong thing. So differential treatment I don't think these days is much about bias or, or let me say it's not much about prejudice. There is a bias because everybody has a bias, you, me, everybody simply means a leaning in one direction over another direction. We have an opinion about whatever that leans us toward that that way of looking at why things are the way things are. So we all have a bias, but hopefully we are not exercising prejudice, uh, hatred, or uh, put-downs that's more of a prejudice slash racist thing. <sighs> but anyway, differential treatment in some cases, hopefully not many, uh, does still exist in certain areas of the country. Um, 
as well as I won't say more because it gets complicated okay because we've gotten roughly halfway even though we're 10 minutes early I'm gonna let you guys leave Dodge now okay until next time uh, you can get out of Dodge okay uh, Wellington am I correct that Amy's not there right yeah okay she's not there <laughs>